So let's get into the AFC North. Um, so we're going to start from the bottom up. We're going to kind of talk about like if this team was to win a division, what went right for each team. So gen- we're going to start off first at the bottom of the division. Mm-hmm. Cincinnati Bengals. What would have to go right for the Cincinnati Bengals to win the division this year? We'll start off with that question first. I think they would need Jesus to play on their team. Uh, <laughs> just to be quite honest with you. You don't believe Jesus has red hair? I do not believe Jesus has red hair. But whatever <laughs> it is, they, I think they honestly need a miracle. Uh, A.J. Green just got hurt. Their team was not that inspiring last year. Um, they've been sort of those, that perennial middle of the pack team anyways. Um, I think they need a miracle. What about you? Well, you know, I, I'm looking at it right now. And just recently there was um, a quarterback tears article that came out and you'd be surprised kind of actually what the reviews on Andy Dalton were basically what a lot of scouts executives said around him is if you put the right team around him, Andy Dalton can succeed. If you have a top five roster in the NFL, Andy Dalton could is a playoff quarterback. However, the problem is the Bengals probably have closer to a bottom five roster in the league. Um, I, the, Andy, the A.J. Green injury, devastating. You never want to see a talented player like A.J. Green go down. Um, the reasoning behind the injury is definitely where you get more and more agitated with the Bengals situation so basically they were forced to practice on less than ideal field conditions the players had already voice concerns and obviously you lose a high-end talent in green heck even some of the other wide receivers went down with injuries throughout the day so the Bengals are banged up right now they're banged up their talent is low but I will say there is kind of a bright bright spot with them they got rid of Marvin Lewis, you know, now yeah. Marvin Lewis was a great coach for many years. Um, much respect to him, but at the end of the day to be a coach for almost two decades in the league and not win a playoff game. Now, I don't know what Zach Taylor is going to be as a coach. I don't know if he's going to be good, bad, but at the, this point they just need to do something different. Um, when it comes to, it, and it's kind of inspired a weird trend. Like basically if you shook hands with Sean McVay at one point, you basically got a head coaching job. We're going to talk about Matt before later when we get into the green Bay Packers. Um, but I think that there is a little bit of something to Zach Taylor. I mean, obviously he was there the last two years with Jared Goff. Um, we saw Jared Goff take a huge leap. Um, now obviously Andy Dalton's a little bit further into his NFL career. So how much more learning is, he going to be able to do at this point guess we'll see but i think that they're provided that they can find some good health here in the next few weeks like john ross can maybe show why he was drafted in the first round tyler boyd is a solid will receiver there they have they have joe mixon second round pick looked explosive at time, points last year they have some offensive weapons that's for sure the the downer too is another another injury too to their first rounder Jonah Williams we won't see him this year you you never want to hear that especially from a top 10 pick um when it was discussed and we'll discuss this guy a little later on too everyone every mock I read had Devin Bush going over to them and Devin Bush would have been a fantastic add to that defense especially since this was a horrible defense historically bad I remember watching that game that they played against the Saints. It was seriously like watching a college team. This Drew Brees had no difficulty make, completing any pass. It was it was a gross game to watch, honestly. That's the only term I could think for, for that matchup. Um, so what would have to go right for this team? I I think I think the dif- the differences between Marvin Lewis and Zach Taylor would have to inspire some sort of rallying among the offense. Like this team is going to allow a lot of points, but if they could get into some shootouts, maybe they might have a chance just because of the offensive weapons I listed earlier. Maybe they get AJ green back in a couple months. And if they're kind of a fringe playoff team, 
that might be their only real hope to get sneak into the playoffs this year. Doubt they would even have a chance to win the division. Uh, honestly, this is probably closer to a Miami Dolphins roster. I would probably rank them as a four and twelve right now. That's actually exactly where I had them. It was about four and twelve. Um, I think you're right. Just too many injuries. Their young guys are promising, um, but they'd have to hit on all cylinders. Uh, one of the biggest stats that I saw was without AJ Green last season, they were one and six. Uh, so if you don't get him back for the next few months, uh, I just don't see don't see a lot of hope hope for him. Um, so yeah, yeah. And, and, and the tough part about it is they're probably on the way for a rebuild at this point. Um, Andy Dalton, I'm I'm pretty sure if they have a four and twelve season like we're saying, he's out the door. I doubt they would be even able to bring him back just to kind of be like a placeholder for whatever their next quarterback would be. Um, obviously we know next year's draft class is going to be a little bit more quarterback rich than this past one. So they did draft a quarterback this year. Um, but we, we kind of did the math um, in our own personal discussion at this point in the league, over two thirds of the quarterbacks in the league are first rounders. So at this point, they're going to go high round quarterback, I think, next year. Uh, I agree. I think they're. I think they're looking to to move on to the future. Okay, so let's move on to some more exciting teams. Um, certainly, the most exciting team in the NFL right now, um, the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> um, so, yeah. being discussed as a potential Super Bowl pick, um, Vegas has them pretty high up there. Um, right now, they're the definite favorites to win the AFC North. Um, but, you know, that's factoring a lot. There's a lot of pers- big personalities on this team. A lot can happen. Um, what's your kind of, like, general take on the Cleveland Browns? So my, my take so, – so, one, they're also my pick, at least to win this division, right? Uh, and that hurts a lot coming uh, – you know, being a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. But I do think that they're going to win it. Uh, that being said, I still think they are slightly overrated. A lot of people have them as a lock, like you said, even a potential Super Bowl pick. I don't know if they're necessarily that good. So their offense obviously got much better. They got Odell Beckham Jr. Uh, David Njoku is good. Kareem Hunt comes back. Uh, I think it's week eight, right? Um, so, so I think all of their offensive weapons, if, they, if they're firing on all cylinders, if their defense is at least, you know, middle of the pack, I definitely think that they, that they can win the division, possibly even make it close to the Super Bowl. Um, my main concern, though, is Baker Mayfield, right? So, so a lot of people talk about a sophomore slump. That's technically, statistically, there's no evidence to show, like, that's a trend around sports. However, mm-hmm. if you look at since 2008, all the rookie quarterbacks that started in their, their rookie year and then went on to their sophomore season, the majority of the ones that did regress um, statistically – were your smaller, your shorter, um, lighter quarterbacks, right? So even even Russell Wilson, technically by QBR standards, regressed a little bit. Now he still did fantastic, right? He still won a lot of games, won thirteen and three his sophomore year. Um, but a lot of the other quarterbacks, right? Especially if you're under six foot four, um, that's where you tend to see more of the regression come. And so so my concern with them is one: can Baker Mayfield uh, continue to improve or is he going to take a step back and then like you said a lot of a lot of the drama right we know a lot of these guys uh, Kareem Hunt obviously uh, is on to his next team right so the Cleveland Browns picked him up uh, because of some of the issues that he's had Odell Beckham Jr. a lot of people have sort of labeled him uh, a very talented but kind of a head case right he uh, he's kind of a prima donna uh, likes to have his way mm-hmm. acts out a little bit and like I said the defense was not the best last year. I don't think they were awful by any means. Um, but but I would I would like to see them at least be middle of the pack, uh, if, the, if not make a push towards becoming better. Okay, well, you know, like when I'm kind of like looking at the Cleveland Browns right now, and you, you brought up some interesting points. Um, when, you, when you talk about kind of like quarterback regression, you kind of still have to look at it as case by case thing with when it comes to Russell Wilson. I mean, you really have to look at the team around him. Many people would say that are, Russell Wilson's early career he was more of a game manager especially when he had the Legion of Boom like basically carrying them you have Marshawn Lynch there um, beast mode 
doing what he was doing for that team. It was definitely a run first offense. Um, now, when you look at Baker, um, 28 passing touchdowns, this was far from a run first offense, although they do have the potential to be a very balanced team. I mean, you mentioned Kareem Hunt. They won't have him for the first eight weeks. Either way, they have an amazing running back right there in Nick Chubb. Nick Chubb, I, I think, would be a perfect three down running back. So it's going to be interesting to see how they balance Kareem Hunt when he does come back. Um, you're talking about, like I mentioned earlier, a guy that led the NFL in rushing yards just two seasons ago. And if I'm not mistaken, was, was re- leading the NFL in rushing yards prior to um, getting booted from the Chiefs last year. So that that's definitely going to be an interesting kind of like um, balance they have to strike. I mean, um, as I kind of like saw personally in my NBA fanhood with um, team chemistry um, and the hype machine gain a little bit too strong with my 2018, 2019 bosses Celtics. Um, sometimes when that hype is too hard, it could get in players' heads. And when you talk about like players that have been surrounded by media scrutiny, they're, entire careers I feel like Baker thrives off it a little bit more than a player like Odell Um, Odell when he's been criticized the most I do feel like he falters a little bit Um, certainly leads to weird incidents like remember when he punched the um, kicking post over there the little practice kicking deal um, when he did that, when he got in the fight with Josh Norman, like it, you get into his head, you rattle his cage. It definitely does affect his performance on the field. And it's going to be interesting because there's a lot of weapons on this team. Um, Odell, the last few years, has gotten used to being the only weapon on the team. Like, is he going to be able to take the hit to his ego of not having the ball um, the majority of the time? Um you know, Jarvis Landry is going to get his. David Njoku is going to get his. We mentioned those two talent running backs they have back there. Heck, um, Baker's going to even like mix in some Callaway in to this offense as well. It's kind of like their third receiver back there, provided he doesn't drop the ball. But I mean, I, I think that this overall is a very deep offense. Um, but also, the guy who's running the show is going to be very impactful in this Freddie kitchens is come over a lot of questioning because he's a rookie head coach. Um, it's kind of a weird decision that to hire him. Um, personally, I would probably have kept Greg Williams. I know Greg Williams is kind of a nut kind of comes under scrutiny for being in the, um, kind of a head hunting gate with the saints, but at the same time, he definitely had that team playing with a lot of emotion towards the stretch run last year. I think it very much showed um, Freddie Kitchens wasn't even calling plays until midway throughout the season. Um, and it's kind of concerning. <laughs> I think I worry about him getting ran over a little bit by these personalities. Yeah. Th- and that, that was what I was going to say right there is it's hard for a first time head coach, right. To, to be able to control such big personalities. Um, and you, especially this team as constructed, you normally don't see this many stars, right? At least with that big of a personality on a football team. Uh, and even, honestly, Mike Tomlin had a tough time when you had Antonio Brown, Lev Bell, and, and Big Ben, right? So, uh, and, and Tomlin had been, you know, in the, in the game for a while. At that point, he'd been head coach for a while. Um, you know, he's won a Super Bowl. But now, right, like, Freddie Kitchens, who hasn't accomplished much, right, as far as being a head coach, now has to deal with some of the toughest personalities probably and most outgoing personalities in the sport. So, yes, I agree. Yeah, I, I think if this team is going to succeed, um, you mentioned the defense. You kind of had your question marks about them. I actually think the defense is going to be one of the sneaky things that may carry this team. Um, I am very high on Miles Garrett. He's a great personality. Like, if he can be – more of a vocal leader in the locker room. I think that would be very good for this team because he's a very down to earth, humble kind of guy that I hope could ground some of these guys, these unique guys around the locker room. Mm -hmm. Um, And then they went out this year, they stole in the later rounds, um, greedy Williams, who I'm very excited on, but um, unfortunately the young guys got to kind of keep his 
mouth shut. He was over one of the many that were talking Super Bowl, and you, you just can't do that if you're a rookie, you know, if you've never been in the league before. Um, but hey, kudos to what John Dorsey's been able to do with this team as far as a roster construction standpoint, because when he drafted Denzel Ward, I didn't know what to expect. I was very high on Bradley Chubb. I would have loved to see Chubb and um, Garrett going after quarterbacks all day, but he went out, grabbed a lockdown corner in Denzel Ward. And um, he's one of my favorite cornerbacks to watch in the league. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if in the next two to three years, he establishes himself as the number one cornerback. Um, So I'm excited about this team. Like anyone, what goes right? Like I said, it's just going to be a matter of their team chemistry, not eating them alive. That's my thought on it. With this transformation of the Browns, right? Like, so think about how quickly they they became good uh, with, you know, drafting Baker, adding, you know, Odell Beckham Jr., Kareem Hunt, all these guys. If they go, and do win a Super Bowl this year, is Dorsey the best GM? Oh, hands down. Like, I think that it's there's an argument we made he's already the best GM. Like, to this team won a grand total of, what, one game in two years? One game in two years. Like, that's just unheard of. <laughs> and, hey, seven, eight, and one, it's – it, it – <laughs> It's not an awe-inspiring record, but to go from one win to seven wins in the NFL is nothing to snub your nose at, you know? Mm-hmm. And if Baker was starting early in the season, they might even be nine and seven, snuck into a wild card. Um, if we recall those games they lost by Miss field goals very early on, a little bit of so-so offense um, with Tyrod Taylor under quarterback, um, obviously Hugh Jackson. <laughs> Um, it's kind of, I mean, you know, Hey, kudos to Hugh. Like it, it's a tough job being a quarterback or a head coach in the NFL. Like it's, it's one of those jobs that in one way I'd love to have, but in others, when you look at, you're always the first person to get the blame. I could understand where it'd be a little bit rattling, but at this point, Hugh Jackson has been established as probably one of the worst head coaches in yeah. modern NFL history. Um, so with that said, like um, this team, I'm not going to put them as a one or two seed. I think if they finish 11 and five, I think that's, that's a good season for them. And I think that would be good enough to win this division. I think so. Um, that's where about I had them in that 10 to six, 11, and five range. Uh, 12 and four is a lot to ask, though. I will say uh, their, their strength of schedule uh, they have the 23rd hardest, right? So they actually have a pretty – Yeah. The, schedule. the problem with it is it's very hard early on. Like, if you look, they have, like, a Monday night game in San Francisco. They play Tennessee week one. And Tennessee, we're going to talk about them in a couple weeks. They're a very sneaky little playoff team themselves. They're a very tough, well-coached team, very balanced on defense. Um, kind of a so-so offense, but they can give problems. And I – I also look forward to that second week two matchup against the Jets. That's going to be a very exciting game to see Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield because I feel like their careers are forever going to be tied together in particular by, um, I'm sure you've heard Colin Coward, <laughs> like Baker Mayfield basically hears Colin Coward every time he goes to sleep, apparently. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm excited to see some of the early season schedules, but it's kind of be kind of a tough way to go, but it does ease up dramatically after the first few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. As long as they can, you know, keep calm, weather the storm, right. Even if, even if it is rocky the first few weeks. Yeah. Then, if they go, if they're a two and two team through the first four weeks, I think that would be a success to be honest. I, I know everyone in the land of media would be freaking out condemning this team if they went two and two, but I think that would be a very successful start to the year. And we've seen plenty of teams start off two and two and go to the playoffs. So yeah. I'm excited for them. I mean, I think they're going to do well, um, especially being in Cleveland, right? A small market team um, yeah. that has historically been bad. I'm, I'm definitely excited for them. Happy for the fan base. Absolutely. Well, let's get into the team you're probably most excited to watch. Um, your favorite, 
more like an NBA team, um, <laughs> Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, so I'm, I want to let you lead this discussion. You tell me about your boys, and we'll go from there. Yeah, so obviously the whole world knows, right? There's a lot of drama all in one off offseason. Um, however, sometimes I do think that there is addition by subtraction, right? So Antonio Brown, we know that he, he you know, caused a lot of problems, especially when he was not the number one target. Um, and I think we even saw that at times where um, Big Ben would overcompensate. So if, if Antonio Brown didn't get a lot of touches, the previous game, Big Ben would almost force himself to throw to Antonio Brown the next game to get him his touches. Um, and so I think by Antonio Brown not being there anymore, hopefully it means Big Ben can make the right play all of the time, regardless of who it's to. And Juju Smith-Schuster, in my opinion, uh, even though he's definitely our wide receiver one, right? Like he's, mm-hmm. he's our primary option. I think he's less demanding of the football. I think he understands, hey, the, the best play for the team, right, is what we should do rather than get me my touches, get me my touchdowns. Um, and so, so I'm excited about that. Lev Bell, um, I had thought he was definitely competing for being the best running back in the league. Um, this, is, this is the part where uh, I'm, I'm kind of on the player side, right? Like mm-hmm. he wanted – long-term deal, uh, especially being a running back, you never know when you're going to get hurt, right? So this going season to season franchise tag, I totally get where he's coming from. Uh, That being said, I'm glad that the Steelers won't have it looming over their head anymore, right? As of whether or not he's coming back, we have to get him touches. Um, So, so I'm excited. I I think our offense is going to take a small step back. Uh, Big Ben had a pretty decent year last year, right? Statistically, I think he might've been the best quarterback. Um, Certainly but, from um, many fantasy perspectives, he was one of the most statistically enamoring quarterbacks. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, so my concern, though, so he played all 16 games last year. If you look at all of his seasons ever since he started, there's only one time where he's played two 16-game seasons back-to-back. Uh, and he's only ever had four 16-game seasons uh, in his 15 seasons, right? So, so 11 years out of the 15 years, he's missed at least one game. Normally he doesn't miss a whole lot more than that. It's usually one or two, but there's been times where he's missed, you know, four games, five games. Um, and so that's, that's my big, my big concern is can big Ben stay healthy? Because right now I don't think that there's a good backup quarterback. Dobbs is okay. I think he can keep you in the game. If big Ben goes down, Mason Rudolph, I heard was not that impressive last year, though. I hear he's looking better and, and, uh, training camp this year but again I still don't feel comfortable enough uh with any of our backups that if Big Ben goes down which like I said statistically he's only ever had you know one back-to-back full game seasons right so uh, it's very likely that we'll, we'll lose him for at least one game if not two games yeah definitely the backup quarterback situation is a little concerning like when you look at kind of that quarterback depth chart um, you would have hoped by now that Mason Rudolph or Dobbs would have been able to step into that role. But at this point, both of them do definitely look like the term being Jags, just a guy, you know, um, but hey, if you can rely on James Conner, if he can take a step, this could, they could get away with being a run first offense for a few weeks. It's going to be interesting to see whether they run their offense the same way as they have in years past, where you, you do have a running back taking on, such a large workload. Um, I think James Conner showed at points he can do it. However, it did catch up to him. Uh, Obviously he didn't finish the season. And I think that definitely showed with that said, they do have a little sneaky player in Jalen Samuels there. And they did add another running back during the draft that I think could help them. Speaking of their draft too. I mean, I was definitely the most, excited whenever I saw them take Devin Bush I thought that was actually a great pickup by them obviously um Shakespeare being gone has left a huge hole in that locker room for a while I'm happy to see Shazier taking those next steps to get his life back together honestly I at this point would wish that he probably just step hang it up and step it up but obviously he he has a warrior spirit um I certainly wish the best for Shazier and his recovery from this point um however when you look at Devin Bush um he he reminds me of kind of 
he has that pedigree to be a top tier linebacker for a very long time. Um, he could be in the Luke Keekley, Bobby Wagner tier um, from all indications. And when you look at the long lineage of Pittsburgh Steelers linebackers, he fits that mold. Um, he's a very high character guy from everything I've heard. Um, he's a great athlete. And he, to my knowledge, has no real injuries history too, which um, is comforting considering they're kind of thin at that position, especially um, they lost a couple guys here in the off season. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm definitely excited for Devin Bush. He definitely helps out our defense that it's weird, you know, historically Pittsburgh has always been known for defense and then running back. Right. Um, in the past few years, I think we've been known more for offense, less of our defense. Uh, so this is really the first year, as long as all of our defensive players come back healthy. Right. So I know, um, TJ Watt right now is on the pup list. Uh, so hopefully he'll get cleared soon. Uh, we'll get all of our defensive pieces, but I do feel like this is going to be the year, uh, especially with Baltimore, who we'll get to in a second. Uh, I think Baltimore takes a step back defensively while Pittsburgh takes a step forward. And traditionally when Pittsburgh has won their Super Bowls and has made it to their Super Bowls, they've been uh, ranked first or second in the league, usually in defense, right? Depending on which metrics you use, whether it's yards or points allowed. Um, so I feel like this might be one of those years where we finally get our defense back on track. And as long as Big Ben can sort of maintain his level of play, I definitely feel like the Pittsburgh Steelers have a, have a good shot. Well, you know, adding like young athletic, like people to your front seven, I feel like is definitely the new wave of the NFL. Like uh, there's no arguing that the Pittsburgh Steelers had a horrendous pass defense last year. But when you really look at it, um, honestly, a majority of the top teams weren't all that in pass defense. I mean, the Chiefs had one – probably even a worse pass defense than the Steelers. And did it really matter? They were in the AFC championship game and short of like one misstep, one bad play, they're probably in the Super Bowl. And the way the Rams played in that Super Bowl, probably winning the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the formula for having a top defense in the NFL definitely has changed. I mean, definitely the rules have um, favored the passing game a lot more in years. So you're just going to naturally allow up a lot of passing yards and receiving yards nowadays. Um, so with that said, I do think one of the other big headlines when it comes to the Steelers though, is um, Mike Tomlin did get a little bit of an extension um, though. Anytime I hear a coach gets an extension, I don't put a ton of stock into it. I've seen coaches get extensions and then get fired that several months later. So but we are talking about the Pittsburgh Steelers, though. When yeah. we talk about that, we're talking I mean, about a franchise that has had literally three head coaches in all of its existence. It's impressive. It's uncanny, and I like Mike Tomlin. I think he is a very amazing head coach. He's never had a losing season. I the way you talk, we talk about the Steelers, you would think a nine and seven, a nine seven and one. Yeah, what did they finish? <laughs> You would think that they finished more like a six and ten than a nine win team last year. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I think that's the thing, right? Is is the Pittsburgh Steelers for a long time, at least outside of maybe recently the Patriots, right, has been one of the most, if not the most well run organizations in the NFL. Right? Like they've been consistent, they've consistently had success. Uh, there's not very many years where the Steelers are out of the playoffs. And so when you're, you know, looking at Mike Tomlin's resume, if you compare him to most other coaches in the league, he's probably right now a top 10, if not a top seven, top six coach in the league. Um, but it's just that it's always Super Bowl or bust is what it seems like for this team, right? They're always hoping for, for a Super Bowl every single year. Um, and so I, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of pressure on Mike Tomlin. My concern is I don't know where you really go, though, if you move off of Mike Tomlin. So I think only giving him the one-year extension is definitely telling him, hey, we still believe in you, but we're not giving you a long-term extension because we need you to have success. So I think they're trying to send a message of, hey, you're still our guy for now, right? But things could change if, if we don't start seeing um, going a little bit deeper into the playoffs, right? You know, 
um, getting past some of the hurdles that we've had. Uh, so I, I do think the Mike Thomas situation is interesting. Like I said, I don't know who you really go after, though. Well, at this point, to me, it's like, are you just trying to wait out Brady? Because clearly we all know the Patriots may, or the Steelers' main roadblock is in Boston right now. I, I think that Mike Tomlin – the, pro- the problem with Mike Tomlin basically is if you do get rid of him as Stillers, you know he's going to be hired in like less than a week. Mm-hmm. Not a Mike McCarthy situation here. Mike Tomlin is beloved. He definitely does. He's a player's coach, so he gets a lot of love. I, I think Mike Tomlin would probably be a great coach in college if he ended up getting dropped by the Stillers. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely think he would take an NFL job, though, or at least be offered an NFL job right away. Well, he, he would have tons, but um, some of these college coaches, they definitely get they paid. Just, definitely. Especially um, if you're so yeah, I guess a big-time I, program like USC. Yeah, he can get paid, have a little bit easier, you know, less pressure on him, um, still do well. I guess my wrap-up on the Steelers – I have them in that nine to seven, ten to six range, probably finishing second behind the Browns. I would probably give them ten to six. Um, what went right if they won this division? Um, I think Ben comes into the season refocused after basically getting thrown under the bus by everyone departing Pittsburgh recently. I think that Mike Tomlin takes control of the locker room. I think that that's definitely very important for him this year um, to reestablish himself as that guy to show why the Steelers placed faith in him, giving him that extension. All right. All right. Let's move on. Okay. So the situation in Baltimore. Um, Now it's kind of weird ending on Baltimore. Like obviously they won the division, um, but I don't have a lot of faith in this team. I, I'm just going to give my schedule prediction for them right away. I see them as a six and 10 finisher and I just can't buy into Lamar Jackson leading this team. I, I think that the reason last season worked, it was obviously such a new offense. Um, no one knew what to expect. And now we're talking about a league that has tape and we've seen this happen a thousand times. I had a personal front row seat with it with Colin Kaepernick and to add to that, we even have the same offensive mind right now in Baltimore with Greg Roman um, that led to Colin Kaepernick. So I have my he- reservations about this offense being able to able to work. Um, now, they did get some interesting pieces there. I won't discount them gain Mar- Mark Ingram. I won't discount them gain Earl Thomas. But they also lost some pieces, too, on that defense. This top five defense, they lost Eric Weddle, who was declining, but still was very solid safety. Um, They lost C.J. Mosley, which was the heart of their defense right there. Anytime you lose a middle linebacker who's basically your quarterback on defense, that's going to impact you. Um, So this defense, I see them taking a huge step back. Um, As far as the wide receiving unit, if they didn't draft Hollywood Brown, I – don't really have much faith in anyone behind him. Um, their biggest strength right now is going to be at the tight end position. So you imagine they're probably going to run a lot of two tight end set with Hayden Hurst and Mark Andrews. But I just don't see that being a winning formula in the NFL. Um, they were ready to fire John Harbaugh prior to um, this renaissance that they had late in the season. If it wasn't for that little run, John Harbaugh is not on this, the head coaching of this team anymore. So I think this is a team that's going to regress. I think they're going to get caught up and they're going to get exposed, honestly. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, like you mentioned, I think it's, it's just marked for regression, right? Um, Lamar Jackson, honestly, his QBR was not very good. It was only like a 48.7, right? Uh, I know QBR tends to favor pass it, passers that are very good at passing. Uh, but a lot of these running quarterbacks, you begin to see them take step backwards right now. Obviously RG three was a little bit different of a situation. He got injury. injured. Yeah. Um, but he took step back. Like you said, Colin Kaepernick took a step back. Um, Zeke is not the best passer, right? Um, he's, he's very athletic mobile. Uh, he took a step back in the second and third year. 
Um, and I just see Lamar Jackson, like you said, taking a step back. And even if they did supply other good offensive weapons, can Lamar Jackson even make good use of them, right? Like he is basically a running back um, that just handles the ball and, and, and runs, right? He might make a few good short passes, um, but I don't, I don't know if he would even be able to make use of some very talented wide receivers, right, that are deep threats. Yeah, I mean, and that's when you look at someone like Hollywood Brown, like obviously when you have a run-first offense like they do, a very run-heavy offense, you know you're going to make the defense want to load out the box. That's just going to happen. So you would say that you should have a weak spot over the top. You know, with a player like Hollywood Brown, he should be able to just get on top of them. But I'm not 100% confident in Lamar Jackson's ability to hit a guy deep. Um, at least when I look at someone like Colin Kaepernick, I did have a little bit more faith in his home run ball. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like Lamar Jackson will hit hit the occasional dinger, but I, I see him maybe more as a gap to gap doubles hitter. Like if we're going to use kind of like this baseball metaphor, mm-hmm. and you're we mentioned injuries with RG three. Like John Harbaugh was asked, like if he sees. Um, Lamar running over a hundred plus times this year. He said, I imagine that number is only more now. Lamar is a small frame quarterback. That's going to open him up a lot more, you know, to get hurt. And now you can't measure all contact the same. Like if it's anything like, again, going back to Kaepernick, Kaepernick was actually very fortunate. He actually did a great job of avoiding contact. He would get out the sidelines, um, out of bounds, slide, but that's a lot of luck is involved. You have some very fast athletes out on the field there. Lamar is, was used to being the quickest guy on the field in college, and that's just not the case in the NFL. Everyone's as fast as Lamar Jackson in the NFL. Yeah, yeah, especially the defensive players, right? When you have you know linebackers that are chasing you down that are bigger, right, but just as quick. Um, it definitely definitely is going to hurt, right? And you you run that risk of injury. So, yeah, I mean, we we talk about running backs having short shelf lives because of the accumulation of hits they take. You know, eventually those hits are going to take off on Lamar, and I don't see him having the long term longevity at that frame to be able to sustain himself. Um, he gets compared to Michael Vick a lot. Heck, Michael Vick even said that he thinks Lamar has the potential to be better than him, which is a bold claim in itself. Look what derailed Michael Vick's career. Injuries. Yep. And, you know, other incidents. But <laughs> we won't discuss those. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think if, I, if I'm if i going to say, hey, for Baltimore to win this division, I definitely think it would take a lot, right? Like their defense would have to still perform just as well despite losing those key players. Like you had said, I think Lamar Jackson is going to have to show us something that he's more than just a running quarterback, right? Like, he can actually now now granted his QB record right like so his win losses was fantastic last year um, but again I think there's other statistics besides win losses he's going to have to improve in um, and their offensive weapons I think you know Mark Ingram's going to have to be just as good as he was with the Saints um, and Hollywood Brown is going to have to show that he's he's like his cousin yeah I mean ultimately like you're not even hearing great things out of training camp, like as far as Lamar taking that next step in accuracy. So it's hard to have a lot of faith in that, like turning around. So yeah, if this team wins a division, it's going to be lack of regression on the defensive side and Lamar showing something in the passing game. Uh, that's just, that's going to be it. So my prediction, like I said, six and 10, six and 10, roughly. That's about what I have. Six and ten, seven and nine, somewhere around there. Maybe like, maybe could be a fringe playoff team. We'll see. Um, okay, so we're gonna move off the AFC now. We're gonna move into the NFC. Um, same format. We're gonna start from the bottom of the standings last year. So that would give us the joy of talking about the Detroit Lions right now. Um, when I look at the Lions, obviously in our lifetime, they have been historically bad. <laughs> yep. um, they've ha- Matthew Stafford's been on that team for a long time. I know Golden Tate 
recently insisted that he's the best quarterback he ever played with, even better than Russell Wilson. But I've just never seen that sustain success with Matthew Stafford. I definitely believe in the ability. Um, but, you know, now, too, it's not even just about on the field production. You know, he's got a lot of stuff going off the field. I'm sure you've heard about the situation with his wife. Um, that's going to weigh in a guy's head. I, I don't care what anyone says. And, but I don't hate this team, to be honest. I liked a lot of the moves they made in the offseason. Matt Patricia definitely got thrown under the bus, and it makes sense because he already got the label of another failed Belichick guy. Um, I wasn't even sold on him as a hire in the first place when he first got the job. Um, I didn't think the New England defense, his particular when he was running the team, was particularly always panned out, thrown out there to be. Um, but when you hear players like their newest addition, Mike Daniels giving him praise that he's a defensive genius. You kind of have to start listening to that if players buy into him that much. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. I want to go back real quick to Matt Stafford, right? So, so if you look at last year, it was his third lowest touchdown percentage ever, right? In his career. Um, he also threw the third most uh, interceptions, I want to say, uh, last year. So uh, it was it was really down as far as his his statistical numbers. Uh, not only that, but he's been stacked right like one and a half more times for every hit than players like a Tom Brady, uh, a Drew Brees. Um, I think he's even if you compare him year by year, he gets sacked more than even Ben Roethlisberger, right? Um, and so, so that's my main concern with Matt Stafford is he's getting older. Like you said, there's, there's some distractions with, you know, his wife. Um, he had sort of a down year. And so I'm wondering if it's maybe a system, right? Like there was a new, new system in place and he was not used to it. So maybe that's why his, his stats were a little bit lower than you'd expect. Um, but I'm hoping this trend does not continue for him. That, that's my main concern right now with, with them. Well, I think if the Lions are going to have success and uh, ultimately uh, what I would say would give them the best shot at winning this division would be for this establishment of the run game to work. Um, they invested their first round pick in TJ Hawkinson, um, who by all indications is the best blocking tight end coming out of the draft this year. He's also, uh, from what I hear in training camp, just a, amazing in the red zone right now. So, that should be something to watch, but it's not like it's the first time that the Lions have ever invested high on the tight end position um, for Matthew Stafford. So it's going to be a matter of, will he be able to consistently find him? Maybe that's more of a fantasy argument, but um, even in real life, like um, I don't think he ever was able to fully use players like Brandon Pettigrew or Eric Ebron to their fullest potential. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously we saw what Andrew Luck was able to do with Eric Ebron as soon as he got out there. Everyone for the most part thought Eric Ebron was, a draft bust and it was hard to argue when you look at his production throughout his time in Detroit. Um, I think though what, what's interesting to me is Matt Patricia definitely wants to um, bring over that new England culture. You know, um, he brings in a guy like Trey flowers. Maybe some will argue that he was overpaid brings in a Danny Amendola, you know, players like this, you know, Heck, even besides um, TJ Hawkinson, they even added Jesse James, which you can argue that Jesse James' greatest skill is that he's tall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't teach six foot seven. Um, but I, I think that this, it, it's a huge cultural shift. And I, you were hearing reports last year that there was a lot of players that weren't really buying into it. And I, I, it makes sense. You, you were a part of the Belichick system. You weren't Bill Belichick. Uh, he hadn't earned that street cred with a lot of players at that point. So to come in and act like you're the, he was the next Bill Belichick um, probably turned off a lot of the veteran players. But now he's bringing in guys that actually believe in him, that think that he is a talented coach. And I think that's going to change the culture a lot. I think that this division is actually wide open. I wouldn't be surprised honestly, if the Lions were a worst-to-first kind of team. 
by all indications, um, everywhere I read about their grading their draft, they had some late round stills. They picked up a very talented corner out of Penn State in the fourth round. Many thought he was a second round product. They maybe reached in the second round on a linebacker out of Hawaii, but they made some other quality picks. And I think that the accumulation of that, they got one of the big defensive linemen out of Clemson this year. I think that he's another guy that could be um, one of Matt Patricia's little rotational defensive linemen that could add pressure to a quarterback position, which, hey, when you play in a division with Aaron Rodgers, Kirk Cousins, you definitely want to apply pressure to that position. Um, overall predictions where I could see this team finishing, I could see them as a 7-9, and 8-8 eight and eight team. I'm going to give them that. Um, yeah, I agree. That's, where, that's about where I had them. 7-9 um, is what I had. Now, that being said, right, like I, I don't think they're going to be an amazing team, but I do think they're the most underrated team, at least in this division. Um, maybe not necessarily the whole NFL, but at least in this division. I think they're, they're the most underrated team. Um, again, I'm not saying that they're a fantastic team, especially all the questions surrounding Matt Patricia, like you, like you mentioned. Um, but I think, you know, as you stated, this, this division is sort of wide open, and especially they are tied for having the 19th hardest schedule, right? So that means that there could be potentially some easy games on their schedule, um, that they that they might be able to pick up and jump a few teams in the division, uh, or at least a team or two, right? Um, that you might not expect them to beat out. Yeah, you know, and strength of schedule year to year often changes. I mean, strength of schedule is based off teams last right yes. a year ago, and a lot of the teams that had generous records also had to play last place schedules. So that's why this league is parity. So teams like the Detroit Lions definitely can make that leap in a short amount of time. So I think they're going to be a gritty team. They're going to fight. They're going to be basically a thorn in the ass of a lot of teams in the NFC North this year, or even NFC contenders. I, if you see the lines on your schedule, I'm not going to treat that as a W by any means. I think you have to treat it as you're in for a tough game. Heck they beat Matt Patricia beat his mentor last year. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and everyone and that was going away. So, so, yeah, this this is going to be an interesting squad. I don't think that the people in the the people in Detroit have come a long way from having paper bags on their head. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Um, and and the last thing I guess I'll say, uh, and this isn't necessarily so much lines related. Um, I think just in general for this division is I really do think that it could be one of those situations where. Uh, the number one team and the number four team are separated by only three games or something. Yeah. Um, and we'll touch on the bears and why they may regress a little bit here in a second. But first we're going to jump into the next team up. Um, a very interesting squad. I mean, certainly led by their quarterback. We're going to talk about the green Bay Packers. Um, so obviously Aaron Rodgers has come over the most fire he's ever had in his career over this last couple of years stretch whether it be his um, issues he's had with his parents, his family, um, gain thrown under the bus by former teammates himself, very similar to a Big Ben situation. Um, that scathing article that came out about not only him, but the whole Mike McCarthy situation as a whole, hearing he was potentially sabotaging plays or just outright ignoring his coach. Um, it, it's been said by a lot of places, but really – what's going to come down to this team having success is, is Aaron Rodgers going to buy into the idea of being coached um, right now? He's been very resistant and I, Hey, I, I will say this. I mean, he's played in the NFL for a long time. Now he got coached up by one of the greats of all time and Brett Favre and at, he's won a Super Bowl. But I think that at this point, Aaron Rodgers has bought into his own hype so much that it's hard to deflate an ego like that. Yeah. I, I, I definitely think there's something to that, right? Like so many people that I've heard talk about the green Bay Packers and we hear it all the time is Aaron Rodgers a better quarterback than Tom Brady. Now, a lot of people say, well, he doesn't have as many Super Bowl rings, right? But he's uh, skill wise, the better of the quarterback, which 
I can see an argument for that. Um, but a lot of people just chalk up wins because it's just Aaron Rodgers. Um, and I think he is somewhat overrated. He's still very good, um, but he's definitely a little bit overrated, uh, especially this year. I think he's lost a lot of good offensive pieces, right, that they didn't necessarily replace. And I think he's going to be challenged a lot more, even more so than, um, than possibly in past years. Well, you know, I, if Aaron Rodgers had it his way, apparently he would have thrown it to Devontae Adams like 200 plus times. And hey, if you own Devontae Adams in your PPR league, fantastic, great, good for you. But that's probably not a winning formula of games. Like I watched his game against Minnesota last year, and I, I was very disappointed when I see like. He did not look like the Aaron Rodgers that I've grown, I basically grown up with. Um, hey, he had that amazing streak of not throwing an interception or turning the ball over. That's great. That's fantastic. Turnover ratio is one of the keys to winning football games. Mm-hmm. But it's kind. Of, I feel like that was kind of a hollow statistic um, because – the amount of times I saw Aaron Rodgers throw the ball away um, or try and make an audible and that play go nowhere um, was very profound. I found, I noticed. And I think that that kind of led to the ultimate demise. When you look at kind of like the Mike McCarthy, Aaron Rodgers situation, you have to assume it was basically they've been together so long that marriage had kind of ran its course and then Mike McCarthy's voice probably more or less sounded like white noise going in and out of Aaron Rodgers' ear. Um, but I, I just don't like the reports I'm hearing right now between him and Matt LaFleur. Um, Matt LaFleur is a very young head coach. Um, and some would argue him gaining the job was even a little bit questionable because his OC run in Tennessee wasn't necessarily the greatest um, or awe-inspiring by any means either. Like, um, he was touted as offensive genius, but we didn't really see it. Granted, could that be more so the talent he had to work with? Was Marcus Mariota a little bit of a letdown quarterback? Yeah, I can see it from that end as well. Um, but I, I didn't see him enhance the talent in the way I would have liked to have seen. And I don't know if that's necessarily going to – take Aaron Rodgers to the next level. I think Aaron Rodgers kind of just is what he is, you know, like we've established what his skill set is, what he's able to do. He's an athletic quarterback, um, but he's not getting younger either. And he's has a much different playing style by Brady. It's definitely more um, reckless abandonment. I mean, and that's led to countless injuries. He's playing hurt all of last year. And I just don't really know if he can keep up this pace. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. What I will say with the Green Bay Packers, I do think that they improved on defense, especially their secondary. Um, oh, absolutely. The fact that they were able to steal Adrian Amos, right, especially from an a in-division rival, um, is, is huge. And so hopefully that defense, you know, can, can get a lot of stops for them and then keep their offense on the field more. But you're right. I, I do think we've seen Aaron Rodgers get injured, right? Like he just had a broken collarbone not too long ago. Um, knee injury. Yeah, knee injuries. Um, and so, so I think that's a huge thing. And I, I honestly think uh, sort of the aura around Aaron Rodgers is starting to dissipate a little bit, right? And, and there's certain, there certain athletes where I think they have an aura about them, right? LeBron James had it for a long time. Kobe Bryant had it for a long time. Um, I think you could even say that Tom Brady still has it, right? Um, but eventually, as these quarterbacks uh, and just overall athletes, they start to get older, they start losing a little bit more games. I think people start to, to res- not give them as much respect as they, poss- as they did in the past. Um, and, and they start playing against them a little bit tougher. I think teams will always play them tough, definitely. Um, but now I think they don't give them as, as much respect. Right. And so I think Aaron Rodgers might not command as much respect as he once did on the football field. You know, and you could say that maybe that could work to his advantage in the long run, too. Like, um, 
maybe now that the hype has cooled down a little bit, um, he can just get to just playing football, you know, relax, awesome. take it off. Um, with that said, I, I thought that you mentioned LeBron's name. I think that was a very astute comparison um, because in many ways, at least Aaron Rodgers' last couple of years have felt very much similar to LeBron's first year in L.A., um, I, I definitely kind of see that vibe. That's older player kind of aging very quickly in front of us. Fine. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be very interesting to see. Um, what, let's kind of let's kind of like well, obviously we've pounded talking about Aaron Rodgers and Endure. It makes sense. He is the heart and soul of this team ultimately. But I do like a lot of the pieces around him. Um, Aaron Jones, I think, if he gets a little bit more run, could be a very dynamic back to watch. I enjoy watching him. He's a tough runner. He's very athletic. He got a little undersold coming out of UTEP, and it makes sense. It's a smaller school. Um, for whatever reason, Mike McCarthy held some sort of grudge against him, and maybe because he was getting in trouble. And, you know, an older kind of like meathead coach like Mike McCarthy, I could see where he would take offense to a player getting suspended for a couple of games by the NFL and basically hold it against him for the entire year. Um, I don't think Matt LaFleur will have that many reservations, though, to use a talented player like Aaron Jones. Um, he definitely started figuring it out a little later in the year with Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis. So I think that he can apply that same kind of skill set to Aaron Jones. I think he's going to mix in a little bit of Jamal Williams, too, who is by all means a solid runner. It's not flashy just kind of does everything well. I think that's important having a backfield sometimes. And then um, it's going to come down to are these um, younger wide receivers going to take the next step? You have Montez Valdez-Scantling there, Geronimo Allison, Equinemia St. Brown, a lot of long names. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if they can take that next like step in their development, it's going to only open up the field for the – a Devonte Adams, uh, Jimmy Graham, who's on his last legs, and you know I'm interested to kind of like see where that goes. Um, as far as my predictions for where this team goes, I don't know if they're going to be over to able to overcome kind of um, Aaron Rodgers' ego and reservations about Matt Lafleur. I heard this mentioned before in other places. I kind of go to get my knowledge, but. I could see Matt LaFleur being a one and done head coach and I'm going to say this team six and 10. Really? You have them that low. So I have them slightly higher. I have them eight and eight. So I think this team has the most variation. If the young guys come through, like you said, right, their young receiving core, if they come through, I think they can be a very good team, especially with the improvements off the defense. Uh, but I just don't know. They can be very bad as well. Right. And, and yeah. Matt LaFleur might not be a very good coach, which uh, indications are him and him and the quarterback are not getting along, right, him and Rodgers. Um, so I just think there's so much variation. Uh, I, I have them at 8-8, eight and eight, but I can very well see them being worse than that. Um, but I also wouldn't be surprised if they won a few games. I don't think they would have a 12-4 and four season by any means. Um, but yeah. they, I might see them at, at a 9-7 and seven possibly being their ceiling. Yeah, I guess I just um... – a little bit more down on them at this point. I just have to assume that Aaron Rodgers' ego is as fragile as Matt LaFleur's Achilles. Um, so I guess we'll kind of like see where this team goes, but I could see them rounding at the bottom of the division. Actually, um, we'll kind of, we're, we're still working up to the Bears, but um, let's talk about the Vikings. Um, so they made a lot of headlines last year when they made probably the most – noteworthy quarterback free agent acquisition since Peyton Manning um, just unfortunately wasn't at the same level of talent as that acquisition was for the Broncos. Um, when it comes to Kirk Cousins, it's, I just don't believe he has that like inner dog in him, you know, and it shows in his record against other competitive winning teams. Um, the fact that he had nothing against the Miami Dolphins, which, hey, I thought this team was competing. I mean, it, it really just goes to show you that you can't um, year to year variation on teams. You can't just like say, 
oh, if we just replace this one piece, it equals Super Bowl. I, again, like a, going back to, I mentioned with my like Celtics earlier, a lot of our fans were in the mindset of, oh, we make it to game seven in the Eastern Conference Finals. So naturally we add Kyrie and Gordon Hayward, we're going to the finals. That's how a lot of Vikings fans felt like, oh, we had Case Keenum, but if we replace him with a slightly better quarterback, this team that was basically a Super Bowl team will make that next step. Well, it just didn't really materialize for them how they were expecting. Um, you saw it kind of blow up at times. Um, one of the most noteworthy videos of last season was Adam Thielen just berating Kirk Cousins on the sideline for not targeting one when it was open. And, you know, there is a lot of talent on this team. I think that the defense can rebound from where they were and be more similar to what they were in the 2017 season than what they were in 2018. And even in 2018, they weren't terrible. It's just hard to maintain that top three defense level year after year. I think the last defense to repeat in total, a lot of the total defensive metrics was the Legion of Boom Seattle Seahawks. Um. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think the thing with the defense too, right? So they're losing Sheldon Richardson, um, who's, who's huge, right? So he's a top 20 DT uh, in the league. Um, I think you're, you're right about Kirk Cousins as well. He's, he's a very good quarterback, right? So he's, he's sort of stuck in that, hey, he's better than your average quarterback, but he's not quite a top tier quarterback, um, like uh, a Pat Mahomes, right, or a Tom Brady or an Aaron Rodgers, and he's not able to get you past that hump. And so while – so the Minnesota Vikings, I have them being my, my division winner, actually, right? I even put them above the Bears this year. I don't know if they'll ever get over that hump to make a Super Bowl. Uh, like you said, they're, they're very good. They're, but in my opinion, they're going to be just one of those teams that always competes for the playoff spot, maybe makes it into the playoffs, but never quite makes it. Yeah, I, I just – I don't see them as championship tier roster this year. Um, I think – it's kind of disappointing too, because I, I do like their head coach, Mike Zimmer. I think he's one of the better head coaches in the league. I think he, I would like to see him compete for a title, but I think unfortunately his career is not going to result in one. Um, I think that they have some very good stories. Like I'd love to see Adam Thielen kind of, Adam Thielen has constantly overcome, obviously, you know, six round draft pick. You know, I think that's very telling of that guy's character. And him uh, and Dick are, are one of the best, if not the best, right, duo, uh, probably wide receiver duo in the, in the league right now. And it'd yeah, be like, I'd put them with any one-two punch in the league right now. Um, certainly with, like, when you consider, like, Antonio Brown and Judy Smith-Schuster are not around anymore, you start to kind of look around the league. Um, there's not too many that impose fear quite in the same way that Thielen and Diggs do. Now it's just a matter of – Obviously, the wide receiver is very dependent on the quarterback position. Um, now, hey, they can get their numbers, but is it going to be stat padding or is it going to be something that translates into wins? And I obviously a big contention that Mike Zimmer had with his offensive coordinator last year is that they were throwing the ball too much. So I think there's going to be obviously regression in those two's numbers, and they're going to transition to be more of a run-first team which with Dalvin Cook, I think could be successful. I think definitely think they could benefit from utilizing their strength on defense and being a run first team. Um, they went out, they went out, they improved the offensive line, which I think was a must. Obviously Kirk Cousins was getting beat up too much. And it's kind of a shame when you invest that much money into a quarterback. One of the big things you should do is protect them. First of all, Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're going to make it a guaranteed contract because they're, they're going to pay Kirk Cousins out regardless of what happened. So they should have at least took the proper steps to make sure he's on his feet. Mm -hmm. um, as far as this team, like where I see them finishing, I'm going to put them, you had them as your, your division winner. I, I could see that too. I think I'm going to put them as a nine and seven finisher. So they're not going to be one of the, more premier division winners in the league, probably a four seed, if anything. 
but I think nine and seven would be fine if we're going to say this is going to be the most one of the more competitive divisions in the league. And as far as them winning a playoff game, I think they have first round exit written all over them. Yeah, I agree. I think, like I said, to me, they're my division winner. Um, their floor is the highest out of the four teams, probably. Uh, but that being said, their ceiling is also very low when it comes to playoff teams. Um, yeah. Um, interesting little team, but I just don't think it's going to happen, Minnesota. Um, that's – and then, well, let's just move on. Let's talk about the Chicago Bears here. I actually think Chicago is going to take a huge step back. And this is going to be controversial. But this kind of goes into what I mentioned earlier when it, I applied it to the Vikings. Um, year after year, defenses have trouble maintaining that top spot. And a lot of people do have kind of the thought process that the Bears are going to take that next step on defense. And I, I don't blame them, but Cool Mac got banged up a little bit last year. I could see him getting banged up a little bit this year as well. Um, you mentioned they lost one of their better corners to a division rival in Adrian Amos. And I'm just not sold on Trubisky. You talk about floors and ceilings. I think if Trubisky's bad, that establishes their floor. And they were at the top of the draft just a couple of years ago too. So is last year kind of going to be a flash in the pan? I guess we'll see. Um, but I don't see them taking that next step like other people. Maybe I'm just blind, but in line me. <laughs> no, I, I definitely see them taking a step backward. So I have them going about nine and seven being second in the division. I think that 12 and four season – Part of it, too, could have been the under underrating of Mitch Trubisky last year, right? Like, a lot of people – I mean, his rookie season was not very good. Um, a lot of people probably thought, oh, he probably won't be that good. Um, but now everybody has tape. So similar, similar take, like you said, to Lamar Jackson, right? Once everybody has tape on you, especially uh, in the NFL, teams are much quicker to pick up on that. Uh, so I think they're going to be prepared for their defense – which, as you mentioned, right, take, takes a hit. Uh, I think teams are going to be more well-prepared for their offense. They also lost Jordan Howard. Uh, I've heard that uh, some of their replacement running backs have not been, you know, too bad. I've heard they've been sufficeable. Yeah, um, you're talking about David Montgomery as yeah. one of the big names getting thrown around this offseason. Um, Tariq Cohen. Um, yeah, Tariq Cohen's still there. But he's, uh, he's a very different type of back, in my opinion. Right. He's he's more of your your receiving back rather than your full out running back. Your traditional but you can argue back. with that and say that that's probably the new wave of the NFL. I mean, we saw Christian McCaffrey really take the league by storm last year. And it's just going to be really dependent on Tariq Cohen, whether he can um, kind of like take some more steps like Christian McCaffrey did, bulk up a little bit, do stuff to protect himself. Because at a smaller frame, he's obviously – more susceptible injury and um, playing, you know, the harsh cold conditions of Chicago definitely do kind of make you more prone to get little tweaks and stuff here and there. And he relies on his speed. So that's definitely the last thing he wants. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I don't have too much else to say about this team. I think you're right. I think they regress backwards. Um, I definitely do not see them having another 12 and four season season. Even 11-5 season is, is hard for me to imagine for them. Um, yeah, you know, and two, this I'm mentioning, too, they lost their defensive coordinator to Vic Fangio, who's one of the most well-respected defensive coordinators in football. He's now the head coach in Denver. So, like, when you do change regimes, like, that, that leaves you susceptible to regression on the defensive front. Um they're implementing a new system with new players. You can't just expect them to be the same defense they were last year. I think that's a little unreasonable. Um, with that said, anytime their defensive unit is on the field, they arguably have the best player in the field with Cool Mac. So yep. we'll, we'll see what that kind of does. Um, I'm going to go lower on them. I am going to put them 
you know, I, I put Detroit, that's Bill, seven and nine. I'm going to put them at seven and nine. Seven and nine? Yeah. So you're, big step back within in your. Yeah, in your. and that pretty much puts, like, we met, you talked about that point earlier that everyone in the NFC North, you could see finishing within three games of each other. I think that's about what I can see as well. Um, I'm excited to see them in the opening game against Green Bay. Um, they're going to be our season opener on Thursday night football. Um, I'm ready for it. You know, league's 100th year. I think, I think we did some good work here on this podcast right now. Yeah. Um, you happy with it? I'm happy with it. Yeah. I hope I think everyone else is happy with it and when they give this a listen. Um, so once again, my name is Julian Martinez. Yep, I'm Andre Wynn. And thank you for listening to the first edition of the Slump Buster podcast. We'll be back next week. We're going to be talking about the, let's see. So we're going to be talking about the AFC and NFC East next week. Um, exciting, you know, old man Brady. We're going to talk about the Zeke contract situation more when we get into the Cowboys. Um, so thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time.